First of all, congratulations. I saw the movie last week. It is an astonishing piece of art and technical wizardry. Thank you. That's very, that's very kind. Yeah, people seem to be connecting with it, which is all we could have hoped for. Thirteen years after the first Avatar and five years after starting production on this one, how do you feel about what you're now sharing with the world, Jim? Are you satisfied with it? Yeah, I was satisfied before we put it out, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that uh, people, people are going to be interested. You never know. I mean, it's just the nature of our, our business that you never really know until you put something out there in the zeitgeist if people are going to respond. But it, it seems to be the right film at the right time, and I don't know if that's that sense of childlike wonder that it can engender in an audience, or maybe it's the, the emotional processing uh, that they, they go through when they watch it. Almost everybody that sees it tells me that they, they cry or they tear up at, at some point. So I think it's working on, on multiple levels. So that's very satisfying. I, I mean, I'm just sort of reeling from the fact that I'm unemployed for the first time <laughs> in five years. Wait, let's talk about that for a minute. You know, you, you've obviously had an extraordinary history of successes, but as you say, nobody knows. Uh, were you nervous when finally you had to share this with the world? Yeah, very. I think you're always. I think any filmmaker that says they're not nervous before their their film drops is is you know lying or or <laughs> you know in denial. Uh, yeah, you of course you're nervous. You know the zeitgeist changes, people's tastes change. We're in a uh, coming out of a COVID era, but we're still not at full strength in the uh, you know uh, theatrical community. We're only running at about maybe 65 to 75 percent of what we used to be. Uh, so we're trying to build that back. Um, yeah, so there's a, there were a lot of variables, a lot of factors that, that made it quite daunting. You say this avatar is more emotional than the first one, and part of that is that you have given Sully and Neytiri a sprawling family of children. Why'd you decide <laughs> to go that route? Well, I think it's a couple things. I mean, one, you know, they say write what you know, and, and as, a, as a family man, as a father of five, this is something that I'd never really dealt with that I wanted to deal with. I also wanted something that would have a universal appeal for people in any culture or language or religion around the world because the Avatar audience is a global audience, which we're seeing again on, on this release. Um, and I, I wanted the characters to have stakes, like real stakes. I wanted to deal with, with as much as the beauty and wonder on the one hand, I also wanted to do with something, deal with something deeper, you know, which is like grief and loss and how we process these deep bonds between, between each other. One of the ways that you show that emotion is through a filmmaking technique called performance capture. And, and let's take a look right. at some of that. It's fascinating. You are very hard on them. I'm their father. It's my job. Uh, what is this, Tanawari? What is this? I'll be nice once, then I won't. But I know one thing. This family is our fortress. How much harder is that, Jim, than straight CGI, computer-generated imagery? And is it, this performance capture, is it worth all of the extra time and expense? Well, that's really the big question. I mean, I can talk for hours about how we do it, but we rarely talk about why we do it. One of the big upsides of it is that I take all of my cinematography ideas and I postpone them into a kind of a post-production. So what I'm doing with the actors is not photography, it's not cinematography, we're not doing dolly shots and crane shots and all that. I'm just working with the actors. It's a very pure art form. It's almost like a theatrical, like a rehearsal for a stage play. Um, so as a, as a director, I'm not distracted by all that other stuff. I'm just focusing on character. So I quite like it. I'm not sure that it's necessarily justified. If, if, you could, if you could film something with actors, by all means, film it. But I can't create these characters any other way. I can't create this world any other way. And there's something about that dreamlike experience that people are having where they're dreaming with their eyes wide open and it looks completely real, but it can't possibly be, that I think is a big part of the appeal of, of these films. 
Now, when Sam Worthington and Zoe Saldana are, are doing a scene together and you've got this camera right in their face, are they doing the scene together or oh, uh, yes. is each one doing Absolutely. Their... We work with everybody together as much as possible and that's critical because when there's no set there and there's no world there, it's all about the actors looking in each other's eyes and getting that sense of that truth and that emotional reality in the scene. So we can capture up to 20 people at a time, which means we can do crowd scenes, we can do group ensemble type scenes, we can do one-on-one -on -one scenes like the ones that you were looking at there. Um, so <clears throat> the important, the critical thing is the actors have each other to play to, and, and that's what allows them to get to that deep truth of the scene. Even, I think, more than the first Avatar, you really portray the conflict between nature and man's exploitation of natural resources. Yep. And here's some of that. Protect the people. Let's get it done. Your message, maybe it seems to me, is even more dire than it was in the first Avatar mm -hmm. 13 years ago. Yeah, well, look, I mean, the world's not, the natural world is not getting better. It's suffering more and more every day in terms of species extinction. And it, we're really focusing uh, with this film on the ocean um, and uh, the, the creatures of the ocean, the habitat of the ocean. And it's not doing that well on our, on our world, and we, we have to do better. I mean, I don't think the film is preachy, but the message is clear. And maybe if people enjoy the film, they go on the ride, they enjoy the action and the emotion of the movie, but they come out thinking, hmm, maybe, maybe we do need to be less destructive and more connected to the natural world. Uh, Avatar 2 has grossed, according to the last numbers I saw, about $1.4 billion. It is an enormous hit, but you have said, you've set the marker that it needs to make at least $2 billion uh, to break even, to justify another one. And, yeah. and, and that, that, I guess, is, is the question I have. One, are you going to make that figure of $2 billion? And two, uh, if you don't, does that mean we're not going to see Avatar 3? It looks like, just with the momentum that the film has now, that we'll easily pass our break even uh, in the next few days, actually. So, so it looks like I can't wiggle out of this. I'm going to have to do these other these other sequels. So I, I kind of know what I'm going to be doing for the next six or seven years. And uh, I'm sure that we'll have a discussion soon, you know, with the, with the top folks at Disney about, you know, the game plan going forward for Avatar 3, which is already in the can. We've already uh, captured and photographed the whole film. Um, and then Avatar 4 and 5 are, are both written. We even have some of 4 in the can. So, you know, I think we can see that, that um, I think we've begun a franchise at this point. How crushing, and I hope, and you think it's not going to happen, but how crushing would it be to you personally if you didn't get to tell the entire arc of the Avatar story? Not so bad. I mean, look, I understand this business, and I understand the vagaries of it and, and the variables. And, and, you know, the old expression, you know, man proposes and God disposes. You never quite know what's going to happen. I also believe in planning for the upside, not, not sort of just making a movie herky-jerky and then waiting to see what happens, but plan for the upside and then accept, accept it if it doesn't work. I read somewhere recently that you said, and let me get it right, I don't want to do anything but big swings. Uh, what if at some point between now and whenever the economics of the business were to be such that we, as you say, we're at 60 or 70 percent of pre-pandemic movie going, if the economics of the industry just become such that it doesn't allow for big swings like Terminator and Titanic and Avatar? I think it's fine. I mean, I'm a storyteller. I, I love having a, a, a camera on my shoulder. I love hand holding. I love working with actors. You know, I'll, I'll still be able to get a job as a storyteller. People still need their stories. And whether that's, whether they're being produced strictly for television, for streaming, I can live with that as long as everybody else has to live with it. <laughs>